At the dawn of the automobile, vehicles are made by hand by small teams of skilled artisans, using metal and wood to fashion frames, suspension and wheels. Artisans who had entered their career as apprentices and expected to continue to work in that career until their retirement. Or their death, which honestly often happened long before retirement. They worked alongside experts in metal casting, engineers and machinists, all of whom, similarly skilled from a lifetime of work in their field, spent hours constructing the mechanics of each vehicle. Because of the sheer number of hours each vehicle took to produce and the years of experience that each vehicle had poured into it, the early automobile, steam, electric or gasoline, was incredibly expensive to buy. 108 years ago, Henry Ford changed that by making the first moving mass assembly line for mass producing an automobile. Instead of a small team of artisans working on building a vehicle from start to finish, the moving assembly line allowed a vehicle production facility to be staffed by hundreds of people, each trained to do just one or two things out of the entire production process. Ford's innovation took the build time of a vehicle, more than 12 hours, and shrunk it down to one hour and 33 minutes. And the rest, they say, is history, replicated not only in the automotive world since, but also in pretty much any production industry where large numbers of identical things are needed to be made in short order. Ford's innovation also helped lay the groundwork for good old-fashioned all-American consumerism and the tradition of getting the weekend off work. And while Ford's other political views and opinions on the world were certainly incompatible with many of the team here on this channel, we cannot ignore the impact he's had on the automotive world and manufacturing industry as a whole. Subconsciously. We all know from copious exposure to carefully curated videos showing vehicles in various stages of production moving down factory lines that today's modern production facilities still use Ford's original model. But we also know from those very same videos that industrial robots that never grow tired or need sustenance have gradually replaced humans over time. Be it Tesla's mesmerizing U4680 battery cell production line, Volkswagen's sea of welding robots, or Lucid's complex multitask automated production stations, we see production lines and we expect them from the get-go to roll out tens or hundreds of thousands of vehicles a year. And when that doesn't happen, people want to know why. This week, thanks to its investor prospectus as submitted to the US Securities and Exchanges Commission ahead of its planned IPO, Rivian disclosed that as of October 22nd, last Friday at the time of recording, it had made and delivered 56 Rivian R1Ts in the first five weeks of production. That's just two vehicles per day. Lucid, which held an official ceremony last month to mark the start of series production, has only just seen the first truckload of Lucid Air sedans leave its Casa Grande facility in Arizona, weeks after production first began. And over the weekend, we learned that the expected October 26th order book opening for the Ford F-150 Lightning, a vehicle that has been heavily anticipated since its reveal this spring, is instead going to take place sometime in December. Early allocations for the Kia EV6 and Hyundai Kona 5, two cars which actually share the same platform, have been laughably small, with vehicles selling out almost as quickly as the order books have opened. And Tesla, fresh from a record-breaking quarter, a new share price that's hit $1,200 per share at the time of this recording, and which now has just officially reached a $1 trillion valuation has just received a massive order from rental car specialist Hertz that will require Tesla to deliver 100,000 Teslas over a period of just 14 months. Or while its latest delivery estimates for entry-level models are well into next year. All of these things have one thing in common. Demand outstripping supply. Of course, some of these delays and production line woes are down to COVID-19 and the microprocessor shortage, Every company that I've just mentioned has blamed the chip shortage for lower than desired production line issues or a delayed start of production. Tesla also has its own issues, which I'll come to in a minute, issues that have nothing to do with parts supply. 
But there are other causes for all of this that I am going to address today. Things that explain why all of these new vehicles coming to market seem to be rolling off the line at an agonizingly slow rate. Spoiler alert, it's entirely normal. Social media discussions on why both established brands and startups are being slow to roll out have been interesting to watch. Some folk argue that the small initial production volumes from Rivian and from Lucid prove that they are quote-unquote fake or quote-unquote doomed to failure. The seemingly delayed start of ordering for the F-150 Lightning is seen as vindication of the opinion that legacy automakers aren't serious about electric cars or that there is some deep state plot to take down the EV. So today we are going to deep dive beyond the conspiracies and explain just what's going on and why. But first, let's deal with those Tesla wait times. While Tesla has managed to weather the chip shortage far more effectively than many other automakers because of the ingenious way in which Tesla's cars are engineered around software as much as hardware, which means it can use different components from different suppliers without requiring a fundamental redesign, only a slight software re-update, its growing popularity means that it still can't make as many cars as customers want to buy. Despite a far higher production volume than it had a few years ago, Tesla currently has far more orders than production capacity. And that's one reason why it's been so heavily focused on bringing Giga Berlin online, expanding Giga Shanghai, and rushing to complete Giga Austin. Its production volume will double in the next few months as that happens, as long as it can keep all of its factories supplied with parts, which is still causing it something of a headache. But Tesla's answer, historically, has been to bring as much of its supply chain in-house as possible. The battery cells. Well, some are made in-house, and some are made by third-party partners. But most importantly, Tesla has multiple supply contracts and multiple redundancies to help it deal with when things go wrong. And if I had to guess, this all comes from that one time when the Tesla Model X was delayed for months because a supplier Tesla had chosen to work with for the Model X Falcon door lifting mechanism couldn't deliver on time or on budget, forcing Tesla to make an 11th hour redesign and manufacture a switch. Tesla, back then, learned the importance of redundancy and the importance of being able to be flexible and to vertically integrate. But let's look at these other companies, the ones who aren't seemingly producing the volumes that would indicate they are serious about EVs. And that brings us to what is normal and how we as consumers have become unaccustomed to the production line process. Making something by hand requires skill and time and resources and patience. Automating that process can speed up the end result, but it still takes a lot of time and energy and money to go from pre-production to series production to full-scale production. I know, because I've been around here a bit, that we have already covered the process on this channel of going from a pre-production prototype built by hand to a production intent vehicle, one which has had the majority of kinks worked out, looks and drives and feels great, but which may still not have been fully constructed on a full-speed production line. Between that vehicle and the production intent validation vehicle, there are a large number of vehicles made, but not actually sold. Those vehicles, if they're lucky, might not be doomed to meet their end as a metal pancake underneath the unyielding pressure of a compactor. In fact, many of those vehicles stick around as engineering vehicles at the automaker well into a car's production run. But they are all looked over with just as fine-toothed a comb as the bank records of a corrupt politician for signs of defects, flaws and inconsistencies. Each detected issue is investigated. Why was it there? Did Bob on the line have a fight with his girlfriend the night before and go out on a bender, leaving his vision blurred from a hangover the next day that led him to not properly talk a bolt? Did someone type a line of code incorrectly that led a robot to badly grab that chassis rail as it progressed down the line? Or was that box of components from Acme Parts Supply Incorporated Corporation full of faulty suspension components that made the car drive like it had Carmageddon's jelly suspension? Only when the majority of those issues have been solved 
bulb fired, the code reprogrammed, and the Acme Part Supply Incorporated Corporation given a stern talking to by the head of manufacturing, can the car be given a green light to actually begin series production? But here's the thing, the dirty little secret. It is impossible to spot all production flaws and issues before series production starts. Why is it impossible? Well, there are thousands of parts in every car, regardless of what it's powered by. There are hundreds of people involved in the production line process. And increasingly so, hundreds of automated steps. Each one of these points of failure can fail in any number of unusual and unexpected ways. If every potential kink in the production process was tackled before production actually began, we would never actually see cars roll off the line. Which is why, at first, production lines operate at a seemingly glacial pace. Indeed, as Winter talked about in his ID4 all-wheel drive review just here, link below, the lines will test run, producing nothing at all for a while to check, for example, that there's no bits of production equipment fouling other bits. That process of refinement and QC continues long into a vehicle's production, but it's at its most intense when series production has just begun, or when there's a massive change in parts or production techniques, or when there's just been a recall event that requires vehicles to be more carefully examined. And that gets us to the initial production runs of the Rivian R1T and the Lucid Air sedan, and why they are seemingly so darned low volume. In addition to checking the line and the staff and the computers and the robots, both companies are making their first mass-produced vehicle on brand new production lines. Although all of the people involved in the production line work are veterans of the automotive industry, the production line itself is brand new, which means you're not only troubleshooting the vehicle design and production, but all of that new equipment too. Oh, and lest we not forget, the first vehicles from a startup are usually destined for company executives, employees, and early backers of the company. You want those first batch of vehicles to be absolutely flawless because you're sending them to folk who have very often paid up front in full to be first to get in line to have one. So that means more QC and a slower production speed. To those who question the seriousness of a company because of low initial production volumes, as we'd say in my home county of Norfolk, that's a load of squit bore. Every automaker throughout history has taken its time for the first year of production on a new car. Production volumes are never what they are two or three years down the line. When Nissan or BMW or Volkswagen or Chevrolet or Mercedes-Benz or Porsche or Audi or Volvo or in fact any other automaker starts a brand new vehicle production, the first few months are low volume. Sometimes automakers make the decision to roll out cars on a slow basis too. It, it's exactly what Hyundai and Kia are doing. They get those first vehicles out of the factory and into customer hands, even though they can't make them in high volumes yet. Does that mean that the companies aren't serious? <laughs> Heck no. For what it's worth though, Volkswagen did something different with its rollout of ID3 in Europe. It made the ID3 for several months before deliveries began, partly because of last minute software issues, and partly because it really wanted to have the impressive first batch of deliveries on its books. Both ways of doing things are valid, but startups whose futures depend on them actually making the thing and getting it out to customers tend towards delivering small batches at first, then ramping it all up. And yes, that is also what Tesla does, even though it's still an established automaker and not in any way a startup anymore. Its first few years of production for Model S, X and 3 were far lower than later production years volumes. Although S and X is lower now because everyone is focused instead on Model 3 and Model Y. And back in Tesla's early startup days, well, the first generation Tesla Roadster didn't exactly skip off the assembly line any faster than the Lucid Air sedan or Rivian R1T are. You'll notice though that I didn't say Model Y in that group of low production volume at start, and that's because while Model Y production did start with a lower production volume and then ramp up, it ramped up a lot more quickly. 
Not because Tesla had broken some magical production line foo, and not because of pixie dust. But because the Model Y is basically a Model 3, uh, manufacturing-wise, with some different body parts thrown in for good measure. It is similar enough, from an engineering point of view, that Tesla wasn't starting from the ground floor when it began production on Model Y. It had a substantial head start. But that's, of course, all by design. Automakers cross-platform cars all the time for that very reason. And the design of Model Y was, from the start, designed to capitalize on Model 3's production process. Very few automakers other than Tesla can do that right now with EVs. Which brings me to the Ford F-150 Lightning. While the F-150 Lightning does use a lot of similar parts and components up top that the F-150 has, it's designed that way to make sure aftermarket things for the F-150 fit the F-150 Lightning, the underlying chassis and drivetrain are completely different. And that means that Ford is going in at the ground floor with its chassis engineering. That and part supply chains means that its first year production run will be far lower than its eventual planned production. As to the rumoured start of reservations, well, while dealers have been telling customers that they believe there's a change in date, Ford hasn't officially announced anything yet. And when I did reach out to Ford for clarification last week, that's exactly what I was told. Ford says it's still on target to produce the F-150 Lightning starting next spring, but I have no further information to share. That said, while global battery shortages and global microprocessor shortages are expected to cause problems for many automakers and many new vehicles for some time to come, there is a new one that we need to keep an eye on. Magnesium shortages. But that, I fear, is for another video. That's it for today. If you like the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to this channel and our other channel, Transport Evolved Take Two. I know that while a fair few of you are already subscribed, many more aren't. So go on, hit the bell and help us out. Let us know below what you thought of the video. And if you're not someone who likes the YouTube comment section, I honestly do not, then please do consider taking us to our Discord server. It's free and the link's below. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew. Go out to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month Patreon supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons. That's Joseph Broucher, David Janakula, Andrew Martin, Guido Drahoa, Brophy Wolf, Michael Goad, Tazla in the Gong, Sean Ueda, Gordon C, Ray Jean Fellows, Anonymous Freak, Jim Burness, Carl Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Ricky Leon, Brian Newton, Laura Sanborn, Rory Litwin, and Denny Hyde. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters, John Lyon, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, Joe Brenzi, Chris Akentavar, JP Pickback, Will Graylin, Matthew Drobnik, Christopher Lee Jones, Paul Conway, Ellery Hennersley, and Ian. If you'd like to join the ranks of our wonderful supporters, you will find links below to Patreon, Bitcoin, and Kofi. And of course, you can also buy your very own TE swag, like this t shirt, which someone bought today at our Red Bubble store. Help us get the video editor that we really need on the channel. Thanks for joining me, and as always, Keep evolving!